I recently came across a story I'd like to share. To my surprise, none of my friends or co-workers had ever heard of it, despite of the devastating consequences it left behind. The story I'm about to tell is about the Mayak nuclear plant, a factory built in secret for the Soviet's atomic bomb project, a project releasing some of the deadliest radioactive disasters in history kept secret from the victims for over 30 years. This is 1000 people. And this is the number of people affected by radiation from the Mayak plant. Five hundred thousand is the estimated number. On September 29, 1957, residents of a small Soviet farm cared for their crops of wheat and potatoes. Other herded cattle. Women hung out their families' clothes to dry. Suddenly, a truck carrying armed soldiers arrived. One of the soldiers started shooting any animal he saw. Another started burying the crops, while the third sprayed a mysterious chemical on the buildings. The farmers were told to leave at once, with no explanation given. To understand the behavior of the soldiers, we need to go back 12 years in time. In 1945, the United States detonated two atomic bombs over the Japanese cities of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, ending the Second World War. After the war, the Soviet Union lagged behind the United States in development of nuclear weapons, so its government started a rapid research and development program to produce a sufficient amount of weapon-grade uranium and plutonium. The top-secret Mayak nuclear plant was built in haste between 1945 and 1948 in the southern Ural Mountains of the Soviet Union, far away from the closest city. The construction work was primarily performed by 42,000 unprofessional workers, consisting of military crews and prisoners of war. Workers building later stages of the plant were often working next to already operating reactors and processing facilities, which were releasing radioactive gases and wastewater. This would not only be for the construction workers building the factory, but also for the plant workers themselves, who at the time were rumored to be handling plutonium with their bare hands. It was a factory built with flaws and severe lack of knowledge about nuclear power. Ten nuclear reactors were built in total, five of which were used to produce plutonium needed for nuclear weapons. The pressure from Moscow to get the plant operational was relentless. Environmental concerns and safety was not a priority. Along with the secret factory, there was a need for a secret city where workers and their families could live. This city was given the name Chelyabinsk 40. In the beginning, the families who settled were never allowed to leave the city. They were now in possession of top secret information and considered missing by their relatives back home. Anyone refusing to stay would be sent to concentration camps or executed. Нам говорили, что мы живем в секретном месте. Чтобы попасть в этот регион, понадобилась бы полномасштабная военная операция. Это был прекрасный город. Школы хорошо финансировались, а здравоохранение было лучшим в стране. Наши дети могли играть на улице до 11 вечера без всяких проблем. В других городах такого не было. У нас было все. Магазины были полны еды. Наше молчание было платой государству за лучшую жизнь. Мы были спасителями мира, создателями ядерного щита. The plant's reactors required large amounts of cooling. Lake Kasyltash was the largest natural lake capable of providing the necessary cooling water to the reactors. But it was rapidly contaminated because of the use of the open-loop cooling system. Yes, that means a system where the water that passes over the uranium graphite fuel rods gets dumped right back into the lake. In this case, 
back into Lake Kisiltas. In later plant designs, such as Chernobyl, this system was replaced with a closed-loop cooling system, where cold water in a separate circuit cooled the reactor's water indirectly. But Lake Isiltas was located right next to Chelyabinsk 40, and its residents used it for fishing, swimming, and even as a source of drinking water. The lake's water was also used to mix concrete for the city's buildings. The contamination of Lake Isiltas was already a disaster, but it pales in comparison to what came next. The Tekka River, which flows past countless rural communities, soon became the main channel for the dumping of Mayak's toxic waste. From 1949 to 1956, the Mayak complex dumped an estimated 76 million cubic meters of radioactive wastewater into the river. As many as 40 villages lined the river at the time. For 24 of them, the Tekka was a major source of water, preferring river water to well water. But the most radioactive waste was stored in containers kept in concrete cells and buried underground in a canyon. There were 20 stainless steel containers in all. The containers were hot, so they relied on cold water for cooling. However, several of the measuring instruments failed during the first years of operation. A duty technician named Komaro noted approximately 3 p.m. on 29 of September 1957 that there was a great deal of yellow smoke coming from the cans in the third complex. They assumed it was an electrical problem. Four workers on the duty team were lowered into the relevant corridor below with a lamp. They had to make their way by touch because of the smoke. Nothing out of the order with the wiring was discovered, but they noted it was extremely hot in the corridor. They turned on the ventilation system and were lifted back up. At 4.22 p.m., an enormous explosion was heard. Container number 14 had exploded. The blast tore through a 160-ton concrete slab. The explosion released material into the environment equal to a 20-kiloton nuclear bomb, the same amount that was dropped on Hiroshima. It settled over an area of 20,000 square kilometers home to 270,000 people. The workers at the Mayak plant did not immediately notice the contamination. In the first hours after the explosion, radioactive substances were brought into the city on the wheels of cars and buses, as well as on the clothes and shoes of industrial workers. Residents were soon to discover a mysterious green glow in the sky, but they were told by the regime that this only was the Northern Lights. The true reason was kept. Военные собрали жителей моей деревни. Никто открыто не обсуждал масштабы опасности. Было очевидно, что они не до конца понимали ситуацию. Здания были дезактивированы, зараженные предметы уничтожены, животных застрелили прямо у нас на глазах. На четвертый день мы заметили у молодняка кровавый понос. У детей также начались проблемы с желудочно-кишечным трактом. У меня тоже была беда. Моя десятимесячная дочь наткнулась на темное облако в огороде вместе с бабушкой, которая собирала картошку. У малышки начался понос, и она умерла через несколько дней. Мой ребенок до сих пор похоронен на кладбище в Бердянише. И так было со многими маленькими детьми. У взрослых организмы были крепче. Their livelihoods were destroyed, and no reason was given. It was not until the 12th of November 1957 that the Council of Ministers issued an order evacuating the citizens of Beridanish, Saltikovo and Galiakovo almost two months after the explosion, but many villages and towns were not evacuated until the first symptoms of radiation sickness already had appeared, such as skin peeling off the body. Doctors called it a special disease, because they were not allowed to note radiation in the diagnosis as long as the nuclear facility was secret. But it was the liquidators who suffered more than others, since there were no similar precedents before, 
and no clear regulations of action. Prisoners were offered reduced sentences if they agreed to help with the cleanup. These groups became known as the Death Squads. They were rumored to be covering a film while doing the cleanup. When the film turned black, it would give an indication that they had received the maximum amount of radiation. It is important to remember that unlike Chernobyl, which released radioactive material from a single reactor, the Kishtim disaster unleashed an enormous amount of waste that had accumulated in liquid form from multiple reactors over time. One would believe that the Kishtim disaster would be the end of the Mayak plant, but that is far from true. The Mayak site continued producing plutonium because of the Cold War pressure, while also storing waste in the same underground containers. Lake Karache, a small lake south of the plant, was then designated a close-by and convenient dumping ground for large quantities of high-level radioactive waste, too hot to be stored in the facility's underground storage vats. And in true Soviet fashion, the people living in the cities and nearby villages were not told of the dumping due to security concerns of the Soviet government. And over the years it was used as a dumping site, it became the single most contaminated spot on Earth. Over time, the water began to evaporate from the lake, and in 1968, a particularly dry season caused the lake to evaporate extensively. The radioactive sediments in the lake bed were now exposed to the air. Wind then carried the radioactive material all over the region. In 1990, the radiation levels by the lake was measured to be 600 rankins per hour, sufficient to give a lethal dose to a human within less than an hour. It was eventually decided to completely fill the lake with concrete blocks and dirt in an effort to contain the radioactive materials. As of December 2016, the lake status is completely filled. The true death toll from Mayak disasters remains unknown, but the impact is still visible today. Local residents say that nearly everyone who stays in the contaminated zones dies from cancer, and their children are born with severe illnesses. Secrecy and restricted access have left most health studies based on incomplete or leaked data, making firm conclusions impossible. On top of this, sick patients were deliberately placed in different hospitals spread over multiple regions to make it harder to keep track of the statistics. Secrecy was so strict that even plant workers and liquidators who died from radiation poisoning in the late 1980s had the true cause of their deaths hidden from their own families. Compensation was finally offered in the early 2000s, but it came with a string attached. Residents were given a choice between a payment of rubles equivalent to around $30,000 or new housing. Many who chose the cash received only partial payments and the new homes provided were still within contaminated zones. Children who lost their parents would receive a small compensation, but parents who lost their children would not. Declassified reports revealed that the CIA was aware of the 1957 Kishtim explosion as early as 1959, but chose to keep it secret to avoid anti-nuclear movements and concern among people living near nuclear facilities in the USA. It was not until 1992, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, that Russia officially admitted the disaster. Yet even then, they refused to acknowledge its devastating impact on human health. Unlike Chernobyl, Mayak has never been abandoned. The plant continues to produce nuclear waste and release contamination into its surroundings. Today, the discharges are smaller than in the past, but they are constant and their impact persists. Local activists work under immense personal risk to draw attention to Mayak's ongoing pollution and to fight for the rights of residents stuck in radioactive villages nearby. For their efforts, many are branded as traitors and are forced to flee Russia for their lives. To this day, Chelabin's 40 remains a closed city. Residents can leave entirely only with permission and a government-issued pass, and temporarily travel is allowed but under far stricter control than in ordinary Russian cities. Foreigners, however, are still completely prohibited from entry. When you see how a lack of scientific understanding contributed to one of the worst nuclear disasters in history, 
it becomes clear why strengthening our intuition of these topics can be so valuable. If you are a returning viewer, you know that I've been using Brilliant for some time now. Brilliant is a really effective way of learning new interesting topics, because while using it, you're actually interacting with the subjects you are studying by solving problems on the go, a method proven to be way more effective than just listening to a lecture, something I can confirm from my 5 years of listening to lectures at university. Brilliant helps you excel in math and computer science, with visual, interactive problem solving and personalized practice. It starts you out at the right level based on your background, and then helps you advance at your ideal pace. I'm experiencing with AI tools to run my business more effectively, while still keeping the integrity. One video every three months just isn't sustainable. But because there are so many different AI services, Brilliant helped me understand the fundamentals. And what really made it a game changer for me was the Brilliant app, which you can download for your phone. By taking some lessons every day, I believe you will start seeing the world in new ways. So if you want to spend your time becoming a better problem solver instead of just doom scrolling, you can start using Brilliant for free at brilliant.org slash solve channel. Or you can scan the QR code on screen or click the link in the description. Brilliant is also giving you 20% off an annual premium subscription, which gives you unlimited daily access to everything on Brilliant.